Anthony Cardinale is the author of three books exploring Judaism from a Christian perspective. The books are The Red Heifer, A Jewish Cry for Messiah, Searching for Jesus in the Jewish Mind, The Unseen Hand of God, and The Pharisees Are Coming to Jesus, Secret Orthodox Believers in Israel and America. Our conversation began looking at the early separation of Judaism from the followers of Jesus, and how that division has continued for 2,000 years. The rabbis were able to come together, oh, about 90 AD, uh, in Yavna, and begin to reform what they viewed as Judaism. The Messianic movement, which we call Christianity, was a generation old, and it was seen as a threat. And they did all they could to make their Judaism as different as they could. Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, one of the great leaders, put the Talmud above the Bible. And his own, uh, his mentor, Rabbi uh, Hananiah said, Akiva, how could you make the Bible secondary to the oral law? So, and also they, 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 they uh, expected a Messiah who would be another King David. He would not be divine. But the Targums, uh, the version of, of the Old Testament, uh, retains uh, this lost sense that it will be a, 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 a supernatural Messiah. So we, we have Judaism today in, among the Orthodox that uh, have come a long way. But what I find in recent centuries is there is a return to the the uh, Jewish teachings that were submerged by Akiva. One of them is that God can appear as a man. Uh, when the Hasidim came on board in the 1500s, they were no longer self-conscious about having to um, differentiate themselves from Christianity. So Hasidim are, are much more um, devout, you might say emotional, and they um, they actually, they, they actually uh, almost worship their leaders. The, the rabbi who was head of, of Chabad was thought to be the future Messiah. When he died, they said that he's going to come back from the dead and, and rule as Messiah, which proves that the Messiah that rises from the dead is not a Christian invention. <laughs> it's a legitimate Jewish teaching. But as you told us, there are many different uh, shades of Judaism, uh, even amongst the Orthodox, uh, and there are disagreements even between them as to uh, the, their theology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, really, uh, I guess it would be helpful to do a little bit of a history lesson here and point out that uh, the, the Pharisees that we know of in the Old Testament and the New Testament, basically, were the rivals, the opponents of Jesus. And after the fall of the temple in 70 AD, we tend to assume that uh, that was the end of it. Uh, the temple had fallen and Judaism had to take a very dramatic uh, change of pace at that point. And yes. the rabbis were able to come together, oh, about 90 AD uh, in Yavna and begin to yes. reform what they viewed as Judaism. Yes. The Church of Jerusalem, which is made up of laymen taught by the Pharisees, they would meet secretly during the week, but they'd go to the temple every day. Why would a Jew who has found the Messiah leave the Jewish religion? And today, the Orthodox believers in Israel, who are secret believers, they meet secretly, and they go to the synagogue on Shabbat as if nothing happened, don't want to be caught. They're really replicating the early church. The rabbis wanted to get as far away from Christian movement, the Christian movement as possible. At the same time, you had the, the Christians who were trying to separate themselves from Judaism and trying to change the dates, for example, uh, of the observance of the uh, resurrection. And, the, uh, uh, and so both of them were going in different directions. Only the Holy Spirit could have done this. They would never listen to any uh, Christian preachers. And so the, uh, the, uh, the scales are coming off their eyes in our time. And how have you been made aware of that uh, 
that distinction that's happening in the 21st century after 2,000 years of the Jewish people trying to say, to preserve themselves and to isolate themselves from Christianity in every way possible, uh, to consider Jesus anathema to everything they, they believe and stand for. Suddenly, in the 21st century, we're beginning to recognize uh, a vast movement in churches in, in Israel and America and all over the world for the Jewish people. Well, about 30 years ago, I began reading the Psalms uh, with commentaries by Rabbi Snapton Raphael Hirsch. He died in 1888. He was uh, a German a rabbi who had to fight the reform movement because when the Jews were released in their ghettos in emancipation, they, they, they became, most tried to become as gentle as they could. So the reformers wanted to take away from the synagogue any mention of a Messiah coming or going to Palestine for fear they'd be seen as unloyal to the local governments. They even banned teaching of the Bible. If you want to have a teach piece of the Bible, you had to do it in secret. So Hirsch was the main opponent. Uh, anyway, he began writing these commentaries. As I read them in English and Hebrew, I found so many commentaries that sounded like a, a minister speaking, almost like he was spirit-filled. Um, he also was prophetic in his his um, his interpretation. For example. Um, I have an example in, uh, in the Psalms. Um, Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. Um, and he says, it was for this purpose they came forward against Israel with trumped up charges. It was their intention to force Israel in this manner to restore all that it is actually acquired by honest legal means as if Israel had, had stolen something, like like stealing the West Bank from uh, from the Arabs, and so he uh, the Psalm uh, cut them off as a nation, uh, Psalm uh, 83, and then he goes and he says uh, in the final phase of history, preceding the advent of the kingdom of God, to which Psalm 93 looks. It will end with the rise of a single world conquering power which will swallow up other nations. He quotes Ezekiel. There will be only one world power on earth that will unite all the nations under its rule. But there is still the one who will be mightier than even this conqueror nation. And he's talking about the Antichrist. So I find so many uh, of his commentaries that are really not traditional Jewish. Uh, preaching, you know? So I, I see Hirsch as uh, an important uh, milestone in the seeping, not seeping, the, 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 un, the unblinding of the eyes. Although he never became a believer, his spirit seemed to have gravitated toward a Christ-like notion of, of Scripture. And then in our time, starting with the uh, Messiah movement, uh, going in 1865 to 1915, uh, it's become, become full-blown with our own synagogues and so forth. But the Orthodox are still not going to join these synagogues. You, you, can you picture a Hasidic rabbi with the, with the hat and the beard walking into a, a Messianic synagogue and sitting down next to women, uh, eating a ham sandwich for lunch? <laughs> so, uh, I, I think they're going to when they eventually come out of the closet, they're going to have to form their own Messianic synagogues. Let me quote uh, from your, your book about this, uh, and it's about Rabbi Hirsch himself. He believed that the survival through the ages of the Orthodox Jews is a way of life of the chosen people, but it will in the final days be a sign to the nations that have rejected Israel from time immemorial. And so he devoted his life to preserving it against the onslaught of secularism and the assimilation of the Jewish people in a dying Gentile world. In, uh, in the year 2000, Rabbi uh, uh, Frank Lowinger, 
who is, who is the head of the Messianic synagogue in Buffalo, Brith Hadashah, he was in Israel and he uh, was warned not to preach. He gets a phone call in his hotel room from a rabbi who says he wants to meet him secretly. So although he feared a trap, he took instructions. The cab dropped him off at the corner at a certain hour. It was in Kafar Kassidim, the headquarters of Lubavitch. And a big black car pulled up, filled with all these Hasidim. He gets in the back seat, and there's a long, quiet drive to a dead end street. They go into this building, all these Hasidim around. Rabbi says, uh, I'm glad you came. He pulls out a uh, Bible with the covers torn off. He reads from John 1. He said, this is, this is the memra. This is where God appears as a man, like he did uh, to Abraham at the uh, memra. We are all believers. There have been 200, between two and 400 of us here in the far Kassidim. That's 20 years ago. Today, they must be in the thousands throughout the land. Well, a lot of the the Jewish people today, as as you quoted, are, are hearing the footsteps of Messiah. There's a great anticipation in Israel that we are seeing the um, the coming soon of the Messiah and a, a time of tribulation and the millennium. This is something very interesting. That's very Christian in in its topic, and yet. The, the Jewish people are also having this expectation. I have some great quotes from uh, some secret believers, Orthodox. Uh, this woman said, most of my family is in Israel and Europe. When I became a believer, my Heavenly Father said I should write a letter to my mother. I didn't want to do it. For two weeks, the Ruach HaKadosh was pressing me hard. Finally, I called. They flew here in four days, and we have impacted them since. Uh, we have this one. Donald Trump and his son-in-law have made an agreement with Israel to build a temple. All of its walls are pre prefabricated Everything is created. There's a special yeshiva that houses the males who will be working the temple out in the desert. All the instruments are there, and they have a red heifer. Uh, there are red heifers that, that, that come and go. Recently, they, they said that there are two of them found in Texas that they're going to send to Israel. And then finally, I want to share this one on the final days. We can hear Messiah's footsteps here in Israel. She, she, did that. she owns property in, in uh, Mia Sharim, as well as in uh, Western New York. We are waiting for him to reveal himself, in Israel especially. Well, I, I want to ask you also about uh, uh, your book, The Red Heifer. This is, uh, this is truly something that uh, brings together so many strands in contemporary Judaism. Uh, explain to us what is a red heifer, first of all? Why are they looking for one? Well, there are different points of view. And I think the, the one that's pretty strong now is that if they find one, they can, they can go ahead and do it. There's a question whether it should be born in Israel. Apparently the rabbis were cooperate with men in Texas, believe that it's okay if the, if the uh, animal is uh, born elsewhere. So there, there are a lot of ifs and, ifs and buts, a Talmudic debate material here. <laughs> it's absolutely extraordinary when you look at the work of things like the Temple Institute in the old yes. city, and the fact that uh, there were actually some rehearsals, you might call it that, of actu actually sacrificing an animal, and that the uh, the movement to, to bring together a new Sanhedrin, uh, a group of 70 
elder uh, rabbis to reconstitute what we found in the Bible, uh, a, a group of uh, Pharisees who condemned Jesus to death with uh, uh, the consequence that uh, we've had this tremendous division with, between Jews and Christians. And now we are seeing in the 21st century uh, uh, an unofficial, but nevertheless a real reconstituted group of Sanhedrin. In fact, I've actually met a, a rabbi in Jerusalem, uh, Rabbi Alero Cohen, who wants to retry Jesus. <laughs> Have you heard about that? Uh, only vaguely, yeah. Um, you, maybe you could tell me about that. Okay, I'll be happy oh, to. Where is it going? Uh, because it's, a, it's an extraordinary to think that an Orthodox rabbi yeah. has studied Yeshua enough to say, wait a minute, he's one of us. He, We should be, bring him back into the fold as one of yeah. our own. And we should retry yeah. and uh, we should uh, accept <laughs> Jesus as one of our own uh, yeah. uh, part of our tribe. And so he's actually making an effort to... Uh, to persuade enough people in Jerusalem that we need to do this. I mean, it would wow. be an absolutely astonishing uh, move uh, of the Holy Spirit to see such a thing. Uh, there was an American archaeologist who was pretty sure that he knew where the ashes of the red heifer were located yeah. in the uh, caves of the Qumran area. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, actually took me into the cave at one uh, one weekend uh, they never did they they actually explored this particular cave for several years digging up the floor and looking and seeking to find it uh, all I got was some dust and uh, some uh, some scary bats in that cave but uh, if they can find the ashes of the red heifer, if they can find the Ark of the Covenant, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, there's a lot of things that we could be anticipating for the future. But uh, really, this is also a, a sign to you and to me that the Jewish people really are wanting to uh, have Messiah and to make him a reality in their lives, uh, a Jewish cry for Messiah, as you call it, for the red heifer. And uh, do you think they can accept uh, a, an animal, a contemporary animal, if they haven't actually found the ashes? Because it's supposed to be a generational ongoing thing. If you don't have the ashes from the last heifer, you can't do the next heifer. In Numbers chapter 2, we're given a law that God says, you will never understand it. Don't bother trying to understand it. In order to uh, uh, minister in the, in the tabernacle in the desert and later in the temple in Jerusalem, the priest must be uh, sprinkled with the ashes of a red heifer. It's a three-year-old male, female cow with no white or black hairs, all, all reddish brown hair. It must, it must never have been set on and it has to be really kosher. Uh, the Talmud says that throughout the centuries, there are nine red heifers, and tenth red heifer will be the Messiah. So the movement to rebuild the temple, they haven't found the ashes anywhere. They're trying to find a, a candidate. And last week they had two that in Texas they found that are possible candidates. They're going to be shipping them to Israel. And as they age, they'll age three, they'll see whether they develop any nine red hairs. It must be slaughtered on the Mount of Olives of all places where Yeshua used to pray. And the ashes will be scattered with holy water, as you call it. And so um, there's a movement to try to find the Herod Heifer. Now, in Israel, 1998, I stayed at Mishkan Sharnim. It's the, uh, the, the Jerusalem uh, uh, place for writers and artists to, to study. It has a windmill, the iconic windmill. I went to the um, 
the uh, Temple Institute, talk to rabbis. Only a small minority of Orthodox are interested in doing this because most of them say, when Messiah comes, he will bring the he will build the temple or bring it down. But there's this large, uh, not large, but very significant minority that are intent upon building, re rebuilding the temple now. They actually have a secret place where they have young boys who are being raised to be uh, Kohanim, Kohans. They're doing Kefmei defilement. Uh, they're in buildings that are on rock. So there aren't any dead bodies under there to defile them. And uh, they really are primed to, to do this thing. The oral tradition. Um, how do we get around that? Because the oral tradition is valued even more than the, the word of the Old Testament, the Torah. In many cases, yes, yes. Well, um, as I've tried to explore in my latest book, Every Jew is looking for redemption. Even secular Jews. They'll go into the occult. They'll go into all sorts of other religions. Um, and the cults find Jews very, very valuable targets. Uh, so I think that, uh, as well as Gentiles, <clears throat> we, we, have an in, we have an emptiness inside that needs to be filled by the Lord. And um, we seek it usually in the wrong places. With Jews, this is especially true because they are called uh, as God's chosen people and they're inborn with this super desire. So it's not surprising to see them going off the tracks. And of course, the Kabbalah is not scriptural. You've actually mentioned in your books that uh, the, the temple, from what you understand, may have actually been sort of uh, pre-constructed uh, ready to, to put up on the Temple Mount. They have gathered all the uh, all the materials. They know where to find the blocks to build with. They have all the utensils. They have all the special dyes used for the tallies. And um, uh, it's been going on for quite a few years. I want to talk about the Orthodox, though. In North Buffalo, I've become sort of the Shabbos goy of local synagogues. I've done a lot of favors for them, whether on the Sabbath they can't do certain things. They blow a fuse, and I, I'm able to change the fuse. But um, there, it's interesting to watch the contortions that go through to follow the law. On the one hand, it's uh, baffling. Uh, God says you must not boil a calf in its mother's milk. Therefore, they're not going to eat meat with milk or dairy. They're not going to use dishes for the same. Eventually, there are separate restaurants in Israel. One dairy, one meat. And we may say this is pretty laughable, but when you watch them trying to follow the law, I've had tears come to my eyes to see the kind of dedication. Um, it's a powerful, even though you may call it the flavor of the law, which it is, isn't it better to have that than to be agnostic? I am probably the only Christian writer who has approvingly written about the so-called Baal Teshuvah movement, the Master of Return. In 1967, when they recovered Jerusalem, rabbis saw this with Messianic sign. They began walking the streets of Jerusalem looking for fallen away Jews, come to my house for one Shabbos, one meal, then come back. And since then, thousands have come back to Judaism, either uh, from secularism or from reformism. And so you have this movement that I believe it was touched by the Holy Spirit. It was the same decade when the charismatic movement came about, which brought me back to the church. Uh, the Holy Spirit is, is drawing them in that fashion to come back from secularism. Isn't it better for a Jew to die a Jew than to die a, a secular Jew? I mean, it, it's just a, a simple way of putting it. On the other hand, the, the, the slavery of the law, um, I believe that those I've seen, many of them eventually become believers. Because once you've gone through orthodoxy and realized the enormity of sin and the importance of being pure, eventually many will find that the, they want more, they want more, it isn't there. They're gonna look. And then 
Only those whom the Father draws to me can come to me, the Lord said. So the God will say that's when they're ready to make that choice. Only in his time. What is the place for Christians today uh, with their Jewish acquaintances, friends, workers, associates? Should we be evangelizing them in that big word, proselytizing them, because it's, it's very frowned upon, of course, in Israel itself. And the Jewish people tend to say, hold us at arm's length as soon as we start talking about uh, Jesus in any way to them. Uh, they're almost offended by it in some cases, and some of them actually just shut you down and say, no, I'm not interested. But uh, how, do you, how do you find that in these days? I don't initiate the issues. I wait for them to come up. Um, there are those who would say that I am practicing friendship evangelization, which is kind of a downplay of what I do. Basically, my presence over the years, being their friend, being their counselor at times, I mean, Jews are attracted to me. Uh, it's just a, a gift I had. Um, their spirit feels something from my spirit. Uh, we have, we've had debates that they brought up. We go back and forth, but um, they don't get anywhere. But my wife is more open about these things. Uh, Shira, we were at the synagogue one day. They were having their own egg meal, and she decided to uh, tease the vice president, Rabbi Alt. She said, Rabbi Alt uh, says in uh, uh, Proverbs 30, um, who is it who gathers the wind in his wings? Do you know his name or his son's name? And you see, just sat there like, I went home and looked in my Jewish Bible. I, there, there's no explanation. There's no, there's not even, they don't even try to explain what it could possibly mean. Who is the son? So, um, and he, he took it well, you know. But um, it's a long process, and salvation is always a long process. You know, Paul the Apostle was saved on the road to Damascus. If he had died then, he would have gone to heaven. And 30 years later, he's telling the Philippians, if I somehow can make it to, to heaven because I'm not perfected. Uh, he means he's not totally mature, totally having reached his full potential. He's saved, but he's not really ready to go. So if, even from that point of view, it's, it's a lifetime process. When we deal with uh, Jews, either Orthodox or Reform or, or secular, we have to meet them where they are, uh, let our heart go out. And your heart, if you're called, your heart will go out. You don't have to conjure it up if you're really called by God to this ministry. And it is probably the most difficult ministry of all, but it's most joyful. So how did you and, uh, end up uh, with this this heart <laughs> call to Israel and the Jewish people? Yeah, yeah. I uh, began to go to prayer meetings, charismatic prayer meetings. No priests, no nuns, all laymen. They read the Bible, they pray for each other, uh, pray in the spirit. And I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I began reading the Bible, and I fell in love with the Jews. Then I would go to a non-Catholic prayer group, and I said, it's the same Holy Spirit. I'm no longer bound by boundaries. I go to any church I want, where we have this emphasis on, on Yeshua and the Holy Spirit. So it was a spiritual thing that happened to me. And uh, I be it began to make sense about Jews who would come to me for advice. There was a woman in my latest book, uh, Barbara Snyder, who said, Tony, you've changed. I said, well, I go to a prayer group. She said, can I go to your prayer group? She was, so she came to a prayer group and she began weeping. And she explained afterwards, she felt God speaking. Maybe he can cure me of my addiction to Darabon. She went to different doctors, getting extra Darabon for her back. She eventually had to be uh, dried up. But she went to our prayer group many, many, many weeks. One day, someone says, uh, you should be baptized. And she said, oh, she left. I said, well, Barbara, why don't you become a religious Jew? I live upstairs from the Torah Center or Orthodox place where 
uh, grown. She went there, she became Orthodox, and uh, she married an Orthodox Jew, had two children, and uh, moved to Chicago. And of course, the rabbis told her Yeshua was not Mashiach. Well, she developed an illness which took her to the hospital over three years' time, off and on. I talked to her on the phone. Her husband served with divorce papers in the hospital. I mean, she was just uh, just a mess. And the last time I talked to her, she said, um, I still pray to Jesus. I read the New Testament. I can talk to him. And she died. And went to heaven. I mean, uh, there is a the primary, the, uh, the book is dedicated, dedicated to her. I have been speaking with Anthony Cardinale, author of The Red Heifer, A Jewish Cry for Messiah, Searching for Jesus in the Jewish Mind, The Unseen Hand of God, and The Pharisees Are Coming to Jesus, Secret Orthodox Believers in Israel and America. These books are available through Amazon and Zulon Press.